really means. And then I'm going to jump into, and this is the practical side, untargeted optimizations, things that you can do to your website to really get people to go where you want them to go, do what you want them to do. And then we're going to get into the really cool and fancy side with tar targeted optimizations. I'm going to throw in a few case studies with some of the tools that exist out there. So uh, let's go ahead and get in there. Hola, me llamo Josh Miller. Soy un desolorado Drupal in Commerce Guys. Hello, my name is Josh Miller. I'm a Drupal developer at Commerce Guys. That's the only audible that you'll hear from me in Spanish, but I tried. I did take some Spanish, so um, that's me. You can follow me on Twitter. Um, so what is conversion rate optimization? If we look at Wikipedia, it basically says it's the method of creating an experience for a website with the goal of increasing the percentage of visitors that convert into customers. So jargon, jargon, jargon. Something happens with customers' jargon. It's kind of hard to wrap your brain around what's happening here. But uh, there's kind of a better way to think about it. And I, I think visually. So I've got a nice visual graph up here. And this is based on what you can get with uh, Google Analytics for free. You can actually see the funnel that I'm showing you here. And what we have, typically, is a certain amount of people going to your website. And then we have a certain amount of people doing something like maybe viewing a catalog of products. And then eventually, at some point, people buy those products. And until you get eyes on what's actually happening here, until you get some statistics on where these people are going and what's stopping them from going to the next step, it's kind of hard to know where you should put your time and effort into increasing that last number. Because ultimately, whatever that number is and whatever it is you guys are trying to do, that's the number we care about. So a lot of people spend a lot of money marketing their website, marketing their services, trying to increase this number in the hopes that that last number increases. That doesn't always happen. Because imagine if we could increase that number without doing any marketing by making your website just that much faster. So this kind of graph is basically a funnel, and it helps us visualize conversions. And that's so important. We can stop here, and we can all just be done. If you can just get a funnel and start looking at what's happening to your traffic, you're going to start finding ways to optimize. You don't need to hear anything else I have to say. But we do have some untargeted optimizations we can talk through. Some things you can do right now that, doesn't, that don't necessarily cost a lot of money, maybe a little bit of time, um, that can help you start to get to a place with your website where you're optimizing that workflow, whatever workflow it is you're talking about. So <laughs> untargeted optimizations, it's another jargon kind of word. It's just a fancy way of saying, get out of the way of your user. We have, it, there are very few of us probably here that own, control, launch one website that no one else has a say in. And so there's a lot of multi-communication channels that are going on. On your homepage, for example, you want some, maybe the CEO of the company wants to talk about this new product they just launched, and maybe uh, the marketing side wants to make sure everyone knows what the next event is because they have to get those numbers up. And by the time you're done, you've got 16 messages on the home page, and no one's paying attention. You're kind of getting in the way of your user. You're kind of having them walk straight into a shop, a physical shop, and presenting them with literally every product all on one flat plane. You haven't thought through, how are they going to find that product? You haven't thought through, well, if they're only going to buy one product, what should they buy? So the first uh, optimization, first way you can get it out of the way of your user is uh, speeding them up. It's very simple. You just make your website faster. Slow websites reduce conversions. That's easy to find out. You just have to sit your mother-in-law in front of a computer and have her wait for a slow website to load. She's going to find something else, a game, something else to play with, and she's going to forget all about what she was there to do. <sighs> Speed is so important. Google uh, once determined that users wanted 30 or more results on their search page. This was about three years ago. I found this on a blog post. 
and they implemented it randomly. They implemented 30 results, and they, and they found that traffic, anytime they had 30 results or more, traffic dropped by 20%. To, the, to those pages because it took half a second longer to load. It's very important that speed be for, first and foremost on your mind because if you have a slow website, nothing else really matters. I have a case study here real quick. Uh, Wawa, I think is how you pronounce it. They're, they had another problem. It wasn't just speed. It was keeping their website online. If your website's not online, you're not going to be able to have them buy products. And... Uh, we recently switched them over to platform.sh. This case study is on that website. And they were able to not only save money by using platform, but they were also able to keep their website live. An interesting statistic, um, they had a Facebook campaign that triggered a sales event that was so successful, uh, the resulting traffic basically crashed their website. It just went down. And uh, that's, that's probably a good problem to have to have so much traffic that your website goes down. But you want to keep that in mind, that part of the optimization is forecasting out ahead and making sure you're doing some things that scale. You don't want to have a website that works for five users but completely fails when you get 10, unless you're really optimizing for five users. Here's another one. This is one that I had drilled into my head for four years as a graphic design student. Less is more. Less is always more when you're talking about communication. You're going to remember what that said because it's really short. Cool. Okay. When it comes to your conversion goal, whatever it is, maybe you're trying to increase uh, user registrations for a newsletter. Maybe you're trying to sell more products. If you give your customer, kind of like I said earlier, if you give your customer 5,000 products to choose from and no way to sort them, you're going to actually probably have less sales than if you gave them three products and they were all very easy to find. Less is always more, particularly when it comes to conversion. And this is something else. Uh, if you're trying to drive traffic to a particular part of your page as a part of your sales process, it's my opinion as a designer um, of 10 plus years and a developer, you're going to have more success if you put one link in a very prominent spot than if you put 20 links in every prominent spot you can think of, because it's called clutter. And I actually, I didn't want to just give you my opinion. I wanted to look this up. Google Scholar is a great thing. This uh, particular study that I'm mentioning here was done by a bunch of professors at the University of Calgary in 2001. And they set hundreds of people in front of traffic sign situations and measured how how much error rate, what the error rate was that they had based on what traffic sign they were supposed to see. Basically, they were looking at visual clutter. What does it do when we throw 20 things up versus one thing up on a screen? And they found, not surprisingly, when you increase the clutter, that's the far right side of the graph, their error rate triples. So <laughs> this is going to be kind of hard to believe, but if you give your client, if you give your uh, audience, the people who are on your website, four buttons, that all point to the same thing, it's likely that they're going to click on something they didn't mean to and not one of the links you gave them because you've just put too much on the page. If you put less on the page, you decrease the error rate and you increase the amount of traffic that's going where they want to go. And that's really what you want. You want a, you want a user, you want a qualified lead to go to your catalog. You want somebody who has the money and the desire to buy the product to actually go to the Add to Cart page. And if they're accidentally cl clicking something because they have to choose from 16 buttons, you've just lost that sale because you had too many buttons. This is another great example, one I always think of, and I finally found the screenshot to prove it. 1999, 
huge, huge search engine wars, and there were two competing theories. One was more is more, Yahoo, and Google, less is more. And you go now to Google's homepage, and you'll still see something very, very similar to this. They really haven't changed their strategy. Got a couple more links. Yahoo's still trying to do their thing, but ultimately, I think Google actually transformed the culture. They changed what their customer was trying to do, which was search. Because this doesn't scale. What Yahoo is doing, we can't browse the whole internet like this. We'll never, we'll, we'll never have enough time. We just need to be able to tell them what we want, and then they can give us ads and make a lot of money. And that's their conversion rate. So how do you get people to have real ads? You make them search. So they just, boom, killed their conversion rate by giving the user one option. Less is more. Um, here's another one. Reducing step, steps often increases success. That just seems like a truism to me. If I, if I have to walk two less steps, I'm less likely to trip. I'm less likely to go and bounce off and see a squirrel that I just saw. There's all kinds of reasons why you want to reduce the amount of steps that are there. There's a gas station where I live in Greenville that they have a loyalty card that's lucrative, super lucrative. You can get like $30, $30, $0.30 cents off a gallon. But to get to that loyalty card, it's like a 45-minute process if you're dedicated. It's a multi-day process if you sign up, you wait for the email, you click the link, you go to their page, you fill out another form, you wait for the email. I, I, you, don't even, you don't even want to count how many steps there are. At the end of the day, you have a, an app that you can just use when you're at the gas station and you get 30 cents off a gallon. Imagine if you could just pick up a card at the gas pump and you would be a qualified conversion person. You're actually going to pay money for gas and they get your information. Maybe you give them your email to, to, to make it active. They could like triple or more the people that are in their loyalty program, which loyalty programs don't make money unless you have a lot of data. So in, 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 in lots of ways, reducing the steps will increase the amount of potential for success. Doesn't guarantee success. You can have a one-step process that no one ever goes through. But you want to try to reduce the friction. So there's a couple strategies we can do to kind of take this abstract thinking and put it back into a website, a site builder, which is what, what track we're on right now, what a site builder can use. Speed optimization. There's this great uh, tool called New Relic. Uh, and if you're a Pantheon Pro or business subscriber, I don't remember which one it is, you can have New Relic for free. And it just you just literally click a button, you click save, and it gives you insights. This is just crazy to me, guys. You couldn't do this a year ago. I now know that views takes up the majority of my page load time on this. This is actually a particularly troubled website. Um, you can see the purple peaks there. That's when you're loading their product catalog. There's no reason that shouldn't be cached. If we cached it, you would decrease the, the site you would increase the site performance by seconds. Some of these pages take seconds to load. This is another one. When you drill into the views module using New Relic, you can actually see which views are taking up so much time. And it, that particular product catalog has a little embedded view that's called Get Locations List Nearby. If we were to just optimize that view, not all views, just that view, we would get all of the speed optimization I was just talking about because that's the, the culprit. <clears throat> Going back to what I was saying earlier with speed optimization, you gotta have statistics. You gotta know where those tools are and you gotta use them. Another example, less is more. This particular example is one that uh, I've not implemented yet, but I, I, I look forward to an opportunity for a small client to just use rules to start doing some really cool untargeted optimizations. For example, let's say you're a newsletter subscriber and you filled out this form. You've picked the newsletter you want, you've put your email, and you've clicked sign up. And then, unbeknownst to you, Drupal, out core, you know, with rules, rules reacts to this subscription and gives that user a role toggles it, actually, because you would want a role that says, I'm unsubscribed. And then once you're 
subscribe to a newsletter, this block is actually just only showing for unsubscribed users. And that fulfills one of our requirements, which is less is more. You want less on your page. You just straight up want less on your page. And if somebody has a newsletter, don't tell them that they have a newsletter. They know it. Just get that off the page. Focus their attention on the thing that's most important, whether it be a product page or something else. If they've already connected with you, make their experience better. They'll love you for that. There are whole companies that base their business on making their experience better for you. Here's another simple tip, and I, and I really can't encourage this enough. Push back on your clients that want to have 16 fields on a web form because, again, this is a step-by-step -step process, right? And if we have this many steps in, in, in an age where everyone's concerned about their um, privacy particularly, this, this uh, particular newsletter sign-up form on the left, very common, scares a lot of people and probably reduces conversions by a huge factor. But if you reduce that to which newsletter do you want, and if there isn't one, just if you want our newsletter, give us your email. I don't want to know your name. I don't want to know your phone number. I just want your email. I'll earn the rest in time. If, you, if you're selling products, you'll get that when they have to give you your billing information. You don't need that information right away. Don't ask for it, because that's a step that you don't need. And that's a step that's not going to help the conversion. So a quick review. These are the practical steps. Get out of the way of the user. Remember that slow websites reduce conversions. Less is more. Really, if that's all you learn from this talk, I'm happy. Reduce steps to increase success. So let's assume now that you have the fastest, least cluttered website that has the optimized checkout and registration steps. But the thing is, we can do better than that. If you're good developers, if you have a number of optimizations you've already done and you're still trying to get that extra 10% of your traffic to increase your buyers, there's some stuff we can do that's really fancy. Before we get fancy, I want to talk a little bit about the information you need to collect and understand. Oh, right, right, right. So I'm going to go through the discovery process. And then I'm going to uh, share a few common strategies that marketing automation services use, kind of like what we just did. And then finally, I'm going to list some Drupal-specific tools that you guys can just turn on and start using to get some really fancy stuff going. So uh, based on Dries' keynote, we definitely want to pursue our customers. So you don't, want to, you don't want to just get out of the way of your user. You want to get to know your user so that you can pursue them, so that you can push whatever, it is you, whatever conversion it is you want to them in some way whether it be when they land on your website, there's something you really need to tell this particular person because they've bought five X, Y widgets, and you need to make sure they know that's on sale today, but only for them because they've already bought five of them. Exclusive deals really can drive sales. Okay, so for discovery. Discovery, all good projects start with a, a discovery phase. Conversion optimization is just no different. You, you have to think about what you're going to do, architect it out, and start getting feedback right away from your clients from, and, and maybe implementing a few of the steps, but not all of them. Try to get some feedback before you go and move more of your, your effort into that. So there's three areas. We're going to look at audience, goal, and bottlenecks. Know your audience. It's important, particularly in automated marketing, which is what targeted optimizations are. Automated marketing basically is what Amazon does, right? It's you go into Amazon and they show you 25 products based on your wish list, your past purchase history, everything you could possibly want, maybe some Lego sets that you've always wanted, never told them about, but yet they still show up and they're just taunting you because you want the Legos and you can't, you can't convince your wife to buy them. That's knowing your audience. That's not on a creepy level, because we kind of expect Amazon to know our preferences. Again, this is going back to what Dries said in his keynote. You need to start prioritizing leads based on what you know about your users. So, for example, if you're uh, a company um, that is selling a particular product, or no, let's say a particular service, it's important for you to know the difference between a decision maker and a researcher, somebody who finds the information and gives it somebody to make a decision, 
and somebody who is actually just showing up and wants to know the bare minimum and whether or not they should say yes or no. Those are two very different users. One of them is going to give you money, and one of them is going to take a lot of your time, and they're different users. So you want to give them different experiences. And if you don't know that about your users, that's what a discovery is going to help you do. You're going to start talking about the kinds of people that pull the trigger on money and the kinds of people that help those trigger pullers actually learn about what you're trying to offer. So know your audience. Know your goal. Seems simple enough. Uh, what is your bottom line? What is the thing you're trying to do? If you don't know what your bottom line is, if you have 15 goals, this goes back to less is more. If you have 15 goals, you're not going to have one goal that you can optimize for, and you're not going to have a very successful, very successful automated marketing campaign because you're going to have crossed paths that cancel each other out. You're going to try to send them to a newsletter and get them to buy something, and get them to get on your webinar, choose one easy button and hit it as hard as you can. And once you've got that going, then choose another one. So know your goal. Thirdly, and this is something that all automated marketing tools are going to try to get you to define, is know your bottlenecks. Where, and this, this goes back to that graph I showed you at the very beginning, where we've got 200, we've got 50, and then we've got five buyers. What, what takes you from 200 to 50 people on your catalog? Is it because it's hard to find a link to your catalog? Is it because it takes so long for your homepage to load? People hit it, but they bounce before it's loaded. Those are your bottlenecks. Those are the things you want to look into. We'll see if it pops back or if it goes away. An anecdote, um, in the 1990s, Amazon offered Add to Cart one-click buying in the 90s. They offered one-click buying, email confirmations, post-shipping follow-up, but they still had one huge problem. This was before they got really big, and it was when they were fulfilling their orders. Order fulfillment is really, really hard. In fact, at Commerce Guys, right now we're working with a client whose sole purpose for their new website is to make order fulfillment easier, and it's, it's taking quite a bit of effort to narrow it down. What, what is order fulfillment, and why does it matter so much? Amazon figured out that they could actually own the whole order fulfillment um, pipeline and make it awesome for their users. But a significant amount of their profit for the next 10 years was put into order fulfillment. You wouldn't think Amazon was in the business of shipping things, but then again, you kind of think about it, and yeah, they are. They're really in the business of selling things, but to sell things, they have to get them to you. So they, they optimized that bottleneck, which, by the way, had nothing to do with their website, had everything to do with customer experience. And that's one of the steps they took to becoming the biggest retailer online. So you gotta, you got to keep in mind, it's not just about, the discovery isn't just about figuring out what can I do on my website. It's about learning about your business and trying to, to reduce the friction at every turn. And I threw this in here at the, at the heart of conversion rate optimization. This isn't necessarily a, a task for you to do. But this is what user optimization or automated marketing does. They know your anonymous users as best they can. If you guys weren't aware of that, lots of people online are tracking you. And that's why you have to opt into cookies. That's why you have to opt into all kinds of things. And if you know who your anonymous, anonymous user is, then you can start optimizing uh, your content and what exactly, what kind of experience you're giving them. So common strategies. What do, now that we know our users and we can say hi to them, let's talk about what we can do with that, the kinds of things you can actually accomplish with this. Uh, personalized experiences, targeted content. A good example of that is uh, I'm a particular kind of Lego fanatic, okay? So I go to, to lego.com, and I want to know what their biggest, most expensive sets are and I want to put them on my wish list and I'll never be able to afford them. Because I like to spend months building this monstrosity and know that it's going to take forever to get through. Someone else might really just care what, what is next in the set that they've been buying for their five-year-old for the last you know, six months. And they just want to learn about the five-year-old set. If we're going to target per, based on certain users, you're going to need to know them. You're going to need to do everything I was just talking about. And you're going to help them understand 
the kind of content you have without getting in their way. So, so what you see is automated marketing is taking all these strategies that we talked about before and really pushing them hard for particular users. This is an example on the Automator website. They have three different users. They're all getting emails, but one of them's interested in triangles, one of them's interested in squares, and one of them, I think, a very creative individual with a red shirt, really likes circles. And so they're sending out emails based on their preferences, not necessarily your preferences as a marketer. This, this is an example of the Amazon page this morning at 6 a.m. for me. They uh, know that it's Valentine's Day and I haven't gotten anything yet, or they just assume that. Uh, I just bought new shoes that look remarkably similar to those shoes. I didn't buy them on Amazon. I'm not really sure how they know that. I might have looked at them on Amazon. I don't know. Uh, additional items. I have a lot of DeWalt tools that are on my wish list. This is kind of cool as a consumer and kind of creepy as like privacy issues. So be careful when you walk that line. Another common strategy is lo lowering the barrier and filling in the picture. This is something I learned from Ben Finkley. I didn't even know this strategy existed. Ben Finkley is the owner operator of Veloci who owns Automator. Um, I was surprised and a little confused. And uh, basically the strategy is this. You ask for a little, as little information as possible, but always ask for a new piece of information. So this is going to be important and hard to do without something helping you know, well, what information don't I have from this user? What's the next thing to ask? And I got a little illustration here. Uh, back to the newsletter that you're having people sign up for. Someone fills in their email. That's all you're asking for, right? Remember, we're reducing friction. But then you want to kind of add a little friction. The next time they come, maybe you're going to give them the ability to unsubscribe and choose another newsletter. But instead of asking for their email, because we already know who they are, we're just going to ask for their name. And then we're going to take it one step further. Now that we know their name, this is when it gets really fun, because people actually respond to this. And this is straight out of one of, his, uh, one of Ben's presentations. Hey, Josh, do you want to be notified when product X goes on sale? Yes, I do. I want to know when the next biggest Lego set is available. I want to know if it's got more than 15,000 pieces so I can just get excited about it. Um, so I want a discount alert. And you know what? You know my name, my email, maybe to Lego. It's important to know how big my company is or to, to company X, whatever piece of information they consider is most important for them to fill out their user graph so they know how to push to you. Uh, another example, maybe it's not newsletters. Maybe uh, now that they've subscribed to your newsletter or perhaps they've just logged into your site to access some, access some free service, we know who this user is, and yet we're still going to do something that might annoy them a little bit. But in the end, it helps us sell to them, which is we're going to ask for one piece of information instead of just giving them a download link. We're going to ask for their phone number. They get the white paper just for a phone number. We already know who you are. We're just going to keep filling that information in until we've got a full and complete picture of who this person is. Once you have that complete picture, you can then qualify these leads. You can look at their traffic history and say, okay, this person's really interested in X. And you can take that lead because you have their name, their phone number, and their email, hand it to a salesperson. They can close the deal because you've been paying attention and you've been trying to track their information in a very, very frictionless environment. Automated email marketing. I don't really like emails, uh, but I always open up my Apple emails that I get because I like the pictures. Because they talk about things that are interesting and innovative, and maybe I just, I'm a sucker. I don't know. But I, I like some, some of my emails I really like. And I think it's because they do something like this, where they track what I'm doing with that email, and they don't just show a report to a marketing advisor. They actually take an action one way or the other what you, based on what you do. If I engage with an email at some point, they should send me another one saying, hey, thanks for reading that email. Would you be interested in this free webinar that tells you a little bit more about that where you can learn a little bit more about that user? Maybe they click this link and you're asking for their, uh, I don't know, their middle name, something that you didn't know before. Uh, if they don't interact at all, then you now know that this is a, a lead that's maybe less qualified, but also somebody who you might be able to tap again with an email just because maybe they missed it. Another common strategy that these services use is lead scoring. And this is what I've been talking about. You, 
you started to fill in that social graph, the information that you need to know about an individual. Once you've got names and numbers, uh, you need to know who, if I call next, if I can call one person right now in my list of leads, people that might want to buy from me or might want to sign up for something, who's going to most likely say yes? In a lot of these services, this is a screenshot from uh, Aquia Lift. Uh, Automator does this too. Uh, they're going to try to tell you what's the next best step. Who's, who's your most qualified leads? And you can even automate it further and probably can convert it into a, a Salesforce lead that then your sales, peop, your sales staff can then take and try to close the deal. So here's a few of the tools that are available. Um, I've mentioned both of them throughout the presentation. I've tried to anyway. Automator. If you go to automator, spelled that way, Dot com, you can see videos. The, the, the tricky thing with these things is they're selling tools that funnel people to the final result that they want. So just be prepared that you're going to get funneled really quickly because they know what they're doing. So if you're at all interested in this, just you know, recognize that Veloci is probably going to be calling you at some point because you've signed up for one of their white papers or Aquia Lyft salespeople are going to take you out to lunch one day. So anyway, the, these two particular products integrate fully with Drupal. They're both, in some respects, turnkey. I believe Automator pushes a discovery phase before they turn it on, so you get the most out of the product. And I believe Acquia just says, turn it on. It'll work. It's up to you to decide which, which strategy fits your needs. We have two different case studies, and then I'll open it up for questions. This is Automator. I asked Ben to give me something that I could tell you guys you know, about the success of the platform. And he said they've, they've recently helped uh, Baseline of Health Foundation. That's what this little pop-up thing is for. They're targeting anonymous users. And they really, really, really needed newsletter subscribers to, to eventually you know, go through and get their final goal. I don't think it was just their final goal was newsletter subscribers. This particular campaign that Automator helped them run based on images and who was actually looking at it and the kind of traffic that they'd had on their site and all of the lead generation that they did, they increased their uh, registrations by over 800%. And this is working with a service that costs a little bit of money, but if, if what you want to do is throw a little bit of money at your registration problem and have a company come in and help you with that, Solution. First of all, you shouldn't do that until you've optimized everything I just talked about in the first section of the talk. But after you've done that, these are the kinds of things, the results that you can expect when you uh, work with an automated marketing company. This is uh, from a case study that Aqua Lift tweeted to me. They have, this is really cool, guys. I love multivariate testing. I feel like I'm a Google employee when I read about it and do it, and I just, this stuff is awesome. So we have the control option. This was a link on uh, one of their sliders. And if you go to Aquia.com, they have about 50,000 sliders on their homepage. There was one link on one of those sliders that they wanted to try to get more people to click. And so what they did was they left it alone. That was their control. And then they changed the text just barely. And if you read the whole case study on their website, you'll, you'll, you'll read about what they changed. Option A was just a couple words, and option B was just a couple words. And after about a month's worth of uh, showing it, you can see it's like 24,000, 21,000, and 11,000. They can extrapolate which one of these options is going to give them the most traffic. And then they can just leave it there, or they can keep option A and come up with three more ideas. And they can keep optimizing for taking the 200 users that are already arriving at their site and making it 200 users that end up on their product catalog and 200 subscribers that end up taking the bait. So that's what Aquia Lift can do. And I think that's really cool. Um, so this is uh, the wrap-up, something I mentioned in the talk, where I was going to talk a little bit about what Drupal Commerce 8x can do for optimizing checkout and that kind of thing. First of all, I want to shout out right after this, after the coffee break, Ryan's going to talk in depth about Commerce 8x. There's lots of cool stuff going on there. But we take this to heart at Commerce Guys. We really want to uh, offer a, a platform that you can build great frictionless user experiences. And when we went to the drawing board, 
to come up with 2x. We talked about checkout and one-page checkout and filling out customer profiles and how do we optimize that. And one of the cool uh, Drupal uh, features that's out there now in 8x is uh, form modes. You know what display modes are, right? You can create a teaser of an article, and you can create a full page, and you can create custom ones. If you went to, uh, oh, now I'm trying, I'm blinking. Um, Krell's talk yesterday, not this morning, yesterday, where he talked about design and display modes. These are display modes for forms. So you can create, eventually, in Commerce 2X, you're going to be able to create different checkout flows based on your targeted users. So maybe you have one user that's only buying a digital service. You're going to be able to completely optimize that to take their credit card so that you can every month charge them for that service. And you're going to be able to change the panes and everything else that you would normally do with a form. And if they're buying a mixed bag, maybe services and products, you can have a different checkout and maybe and so on and so forth. So we're going to be able to start really differentiating checkout forms Another one, this is really cool because it goes back to the primary, very first thing that if you did it once and that's it, that'll increase your conversions, which is make your website faster. Right now, to get your, to get your Add to Cart button to work, it has to load every single product from the database that's connected to that node, which isn't a big deal if you're selling a shirt with three colors and three sizes. It's a big deal if you're, shell, if you're selling um, an event that has... 16 different locations, 16 different languages, and 16 different time slots. We're talking about maybe 100,000 products loaded in on every page load. We don't have to do that anymore with 8x, 2x. Um, this, we've, we've got a different strategy, different architecture that will help us optimize for that. Uh, and finally, we're going to have a lot more control over the way things look down to the product level all the way up to the catalog level because of, because of innovations on Drupal core with Twig. So, gracias. And uh, preguntas or uh, any answers that maybe I have with questions, that kind of thing. Anyone? I've talked a lot about lots of things. Show of hands. Who? who okay, yeah. Is the one one uh, click um, is that is that patent or is that under some kind of a protection by Amazon? Okay, what what exactly about Amazon? Ah, the 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 way they're dealing with shipping. The one click purchase, yes, one click purchase. Back in the '90s, I think they did file for a patent right when they did that, but I believe. This was a year ago when I read the blog post. There was a company that had filed for something similar a year before that. And personally, I hate patents that stifle innovation and stifle commerce. And I really think one-click pay now, right now kind of actions would be awesome for our economy. But yes, Amazon did patent that. And I guess they saw that as something that would be hard to innovate on. Um, any other questions? Yeah. I don't know if, if this is going to be a very open question, but in your experience, a uh, good number for conversion rates will be like, I don't know, 3%, 4%. Yeah, it's not. The, the problem is, and this is my, this is my wife's favorite phrase, uh, it depends. <laughs> uh, it really depends on the users you're working with. Uh, I would never expect to see a 100% conversion rate, never. You're going to find random people that show up on your website from Serbia, and I don't know why they're there, but they're there. Um, not that Serbians aren't awesome. I know a couple great Drupal developers from Serbia. Um, the conversion rates we're looking for, really, percentage-wise, don't matter. The trick is making them go higher. And the, the, other, and the bigger trick is knowing what they are to begin with, getting solid data that you can continue to push and try to try to say, well, okay, I know right now I'm getting a half of percent of the people that I'm sending the email to right now opening it. How can I make it bigger? Maybe it's a flashier headline in the subject line. Maybe it's sending it less. Or in the case of realmilkcheese.com, sending it more. Mr. realmilkcheese.com in the back. 
that didn't send me any emails this year. Um, you're going to increase your conversion rate, and that's that's the real thing. Is there is there a waterline that says yes, you're doing really well if this particular percentage is high? I have no idea because uh, we see them all over the board. And the, the trick is, and it always is the trick, is to try to get the customers and sometimes the developers to take the time to get the numbers. Because you can have a feeling, but until you validate it, who knows? Any other questions? Another one. All right. More about patent. It's... Sorry. Sorry about that question. Great presentation. I really really enjoyed it. Uh, the Drupal 8 for, um, commerce, uh, what's the timeline for that coming out in terms of post Acquia being an alpha and migrating to modules and like when do you guys anticipate being re production ready coming straight from me i don't know it depends it's my wife's favorite phrase ryan might have a better answer you know i'll, I'll provide an update in the next session on like what's been done what needs to be done um, from a sales guidance standpoint um, i tell our team not to plan on any drupal 8 project selling until like you know the second half of the year, ideally, you know the fourth quarter, <laughs> if they can wait that long, um, and uh, that would be to begin the work. But to finish it, I still wouldn't plan on launching it until next year. And and it's you know not so much the commerce piece as it is just everything. So. And this is a conversation I was having last night with Seed, one of the sponsors. They just launched their website on uh, Drupal eight which is awesome and so exciting, and I want to like log in and see their whole website running on it. But they don't have beta to beta migrations yet, so the next beta, they're going to have to like hope it just works. Um, so I, I definitely wouldn't uh, try to start building something on Drupal beta that's going to launch. Even if you launch it right now, it'll work because it's running uh, with a few bugs uh, until you have some sort of migration path that'll get you onto the release candidates and eventually the stable. Any other questions? Oh, we got we got two guys. You talk about like a technical approach, but what about communication and this, uh, I don't know, like persuasion, emotion, trust in these conversions rate increase in like all of our storytelling, one story, how you can talk about that? So there's a um, kind of a competing theory right now for how do you get conversions. And I grew up making websites in middle school and high school that had pages that you clicked on and linked to and you split up your website. And something that kind of randomly happened about two years ago is we started seeing these really long sell one page websites that at the end, if you made it down and you scrolled that far, gave you some sort of way to take the next step, either buy something or to register. We've seen a lot of success with those one page, landing page kind of things that actually take a while to get through because what that does is it reduces the friction because you're not clicking on things. You're just scrolling. And in the typical user's mind, scrolling is a lot less effort than clicking, which actually I don't think is true. Like purely on like I'm going to spend energy. Scrolling takes a lot of effort, but uh, scrolling is just seems to be a little bit easier. There's less commitment. I'm not going to lose my place where I am. So you're reducing friction. And then by the time they get to the bottom, you've qualified that lead because they've just spent whatever it is, an hour, 30 minutes, to get through that content, and they're still there. They're at the bottom of the page. They're ready. Whatever the next step is, they're ready to sign up. They're ready to increase. Now, your question was more along the side of how do you articulate your message and how does that impact the conversion rates? It depends. I hate saying that. It really does. If we're talking to Drupal developers, just the facts, ma'am. If we're talking to um, if we're talking to people who really like to knit, uh, maybe there's some evidence to show that they really enjoy a story behind where their yarn came from, and that increases the sale of that yarn. So it comes kind of comes full circle back to your discovery process and knowing your users and knowing your goal and saying, and being prepared to do things like, instead of just saying, this is the yarn I have, saying, this is the story behind the yarn that we have because our users love stories and they can really invest in them. And they really, because I mean, 
I'm seeing that a lot more on social media. People are sharing the stories behind their products, and they seem to really connect with that. I don't have any hard data to put, to put that. But Google Scholar is really good, so maybe you could just like Google a couple things and find some professors that have <laughs> done the hard work. Any other questions? No? OK. Um, I believe coffee is next. I'll stay up here for a few minutes. Thank you very much. I would really appreciate if you could go online. I know I never do this myself, um, but I'm going to be hypocritical. If you could go online, find my session, and give me some sort of feedback. I don't see your name, but it helps me be a better presenter. So anything you could give me. And I can't really, you know, I can't take credit for the cord not working. So any, anything else? No? All right. Thank you very much.